Good morning and welcome to City Hall. Mark Balthrop is the pastor at Redeemer Reformed Church. He'll lead us in the invocation this morning. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Griner if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everybody please stand? Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you this morning with grateful and humble hearts asking for your grace and for wisdom. I thank you for these council members and for our mayor. We pray that you would fill them with wisdom today, that they may work toward that which is good and true and beautiful. We pray that Oklahoma City, by your power, would be a shining light to all other cities where justice is met with mercy. We pray that this is a place where virtue is also met with liberty. I pray, Lord, as the city goes forward today, that you would be glorified in all that is done here. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are a lot of positive stories going on in the world of education in Oklahoma City, and we are today going to highlight one of them. Tracy McDaniel is here with Kip. Tracy, would you come up and bring your former student along with you? Uh, this is no small honor. Uh, Tracy McDaniel uh, is in charge of Kip Reach College Preparatory School, and he has been named, his school has been named, one of the top 50 middle schools in the United States. How about a round of applause? <laughs> this is amazing. That is an honor in, in itself, and we're glad to have that honor. And I'm here with my, one of my students, Ashley Gordon. She was in the first class. And what year was that? That was in 2002. Okay. And now we just hired her two weeks ago, and her job as a KIPP college counselor is to help get these other kids now to and through college. So we made a commitment to her. Uh, back in 202, and so she's gone on to Deerfield Academy, Mount Holyoke, and now she's back here in town, and she's going to help us do the same thing with other kids. So we're honored to be here and uh, happy to do what we're doing. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Let's share. Let's, let's show again our appreciation to Kip. And I have a letter of congratulations. On behalf of Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mayor, if I could, I always have to congratulate my fellow alum from Mount Holyoke. I'm so proud of her. She's done such an awesome job. I'm glad you're here today. It's nice to see you again, and welcome back to Oklahoma City. And uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could, um, my niece uh, went to uh, KIPP, and I just want to personally thank you, uh, Mr. McDaniels, for everything that KIPP has done uh, in the community. Uh, and I'm proud to say, guess what, Ward 7. Thank you. <laughs> It is also a month when we draw attention to um, uh, strokes and prevention. And we have, uh, let's see, Naomi, Gary, Stephen, um, AJ, and Jennifer. You all want to come on up? We have a proclamation. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled. Whereas stroke is a leading cause of serious long-term disability and the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, killing about 130,000 people nationwide and 2,100 citizens of Oklahoma each year. Whereas stroke prevalence is projected to increase by 24.9% between 2010 and 2030, and the direct medical costs for treating stroke are expected to increase by 238%, from 28.3 billion in 2010 to 95.6 billion by 2030. Whereas nearly 78 million Americans have high blood pressure, which is a major controllable risk factor for stroke, including 44% of African American adults among the highest prevalence of any population in the world. Whereas more than half, 58% of Americans don't know if they are at risk for stroke, and one in three Amer Americans can't recall any stroke warning signs or symptoms. 
whereas the fast warning signs and symptoms of stroke include face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, and time to call 911. Additional stroke warning signs include sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding, sudden trouble seeing in one or both eyes, sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, and sudden severe headache with no known cause. Whereas on the American Strokes Month's Day of Action, May 1, 2014, and throughout the entire year, the American Stroke Association's Together to End Stroke initiative encourages everyone to learn their personal stroke risk, memorize and share the stroke warning signs, and call 911 at the first sign of a stroke. Whereas new and effective treatments have been developed to treat and minimize the severity and damaging effect of strokes, but much more research is needed. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim May 2014 as American Stroke Month in Oklahoma City, and he urges all the citizens to familiarize themselves with the risk factors associated with stroke, recognize the warning signs and symptoms, and on first sign of a stroke, dial 911 so that we might begin to reduce the devastating effects of stroke on our population. Let's show our appreciation to these people who are drawing attention to this uh, <laughs> process. And so some striking statistics here that I think uh, are worth repeating. 130,000 people killed every year in the United States by stroke, 2,100 Oklahomans, and the projections aren't good. We're expecting a 25% increase over the next years, probably because we're an aging population. And Naomi, I, I know you have some success stories here. Um, thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank you, Mayor Cornett and the City Council for recognizing May as Stroke Month. Um, there's been some great work done in the state of Oklahoma to reduce the amount of deaths uh, because of stroke. It's now the fifth leading cause of death. Previously was the fourth leading cause of death in the state, so there's some great work that's being done. Also, Oklahoma City houses two nationally recognized comprehensive stroke centers. There's probably a handful in the nation, and the fact that there are two facilities in Oklahoma, it shows great um, strength in terms of the efforts to reduce stroke in our state. And I wanted to introduce some of our stroke survivors, I'll have them briefly introduce themselves and talk about their experiences as a stroke survivor. I'm Stephen Melch from Ward 2, and uh, I had a major stroke in January of last year. Uh, through some divine intervention, I was home alone, but I was able to start playing with the telephone because I had lost my sense of 911. And by, by luck, the, uh, a stranger answered, and he was able to uh, call 911 for me, and because I was using my home phone, they could locate me uh, and get to my address in time. And uh, through the miracle of medicine and timing, uh, I was able to have uh, this dr drug called TPA in my carotid artery, was cleared, and within 12 hours, I had full recovery. I'm Carol Sterling, and I'm on the Passion Committee, and I'm on Go Red for Women. I'm A.J. Johnson. I am the unit director of the Boys and Girls Club, and I am a one-year survivor. It was one year ago on Saturday when I had my stroke. And, um, Mr. Mayor, I've included myself in your uh, fight against obesity. I have lost 112 pounds in a year. So... <laughs> So I'm very thankful to be here. Thank you. I'm Gary Bulmer. I'm a hemorrhagic stroke survivor from 1976, two brain surgeries to clip it out and remove it. Today I'm involved in about four different support groups. For those of y'all that we may be seeing in support group, we hope not. We are actively committed to life after stroke. And I'm Jennifer Seal with the American Heart Association as well, and we are just so grateful to have people who are willing to stand up for this cause so that we can spread the word, and that's what today's proclamation is all about. Please share this information with your friends and family. Let's show our appreciation one more time. Thank you. And we are also becoming a more fit community, and we have some people here today that are doing their best to help us get that way. If it's uh, uh, some success in Techno Gym, you all want to come on up, Rick? Bring your bring your group up here. Um, let's see. We have uh, Patrick Wellington, uh, Rick Trussell, Alan Glass, Rick Mason, 
Dr. Brian Lampkin, Mike Dupuy, and Dr. Audra Fox. And we have a proclamation for Let's Move a Better World. And uh, they competed against 175 fitness centers over 10 countries over a four-week period and won an award. So let's hear more about it in this proclamation. Whereas Technogym's Let's Move for a Better World Global Challenge worked to raise awareness about childhood obesity and promote wellness in schools. Whereas the Let's Move for a Better World campaign was the result of the Technogym's 30-year commitment to improving wellness around the world. Whereas Oklahoma City's Key Health Institute entered the challenge competing against 175 participating fitness centers in 10 countries over a four-week period with the winning fitness center earning $30,000 worth of Technogym exercise equipment for a middle school of its choice. Whereas Key Health Center engaged individuals during the competition by launching dedicated 24-hour workout days involving local business through designated events, handing out promotional giveaways, and more. Whereas participants in the challenge range from current members of Key Health Center as well as the community at large, including children from Taft Middle School, all the way to a 72-year-old who led the nation in moves of activity. Whereas Oklahoma City's Key Health Center, one of the newest and smallest clubs in the competition, finished first in the United States and second in the world behind a health facility in Italy. Whereas Key Health Institute will donate the Technogym Easy Line equipment to Taft Middle School. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim June 5th, 2014, as Let's Move for a Better World Day in Oklahoma City. And $30,000 worth of fitness equipment going to Taft Middle School. Thank you all very much. Patrick Wellington is here. You can, yeah, show your round of applause. Uh, and, uh, Patrick is the fitness director. Thank you, Mayor Cornett and city of Oklahoma City. Um, we want to thank everyone for all their efforts. I know the group of people up here did their part. Um, to give you an idea, uh, we did 4.8 million moves. And to put that in perspective, uh, 500 moves is about 10,000 steps. So collectively, as a, as a fitness center, uh, as a community, we had people come together overnight, different uh, Thunder Watch parties, anything to get people engaged and join this effort to help Taft Middle School bring awareness to the childhood obesity uh, problem that's, that we're all aware of. And in the end, that would equate to close to uh, 100 million steps, if that makes sense for you guys, a better correlation of steps. But we want to thank everyone's effort, and we're having a, a big party uh, celebration on June 4th at Key Health Institute, and we'd love all of you to be there, 11 to 1, and we'll get to dedicate the equipment to Taft Middle School on that day. Congratulations, and we're very appreciative. Let's show our appreciation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And then on page 30, under items HJ1, item H216 North Tuttle, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has removed. Item J3124 Northwest 13th, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has removed. Moving to 8K1, item A9525 Allen Drive, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item B6420 Ashby Terrace, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item D1800 North Bryant, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item E7901 North Council, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item F5005 Gain Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item G1128 Glade Avenue, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item H3407 North Grove, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item M1112 North Ross, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Moving to page 31, item R1731, I'm sorry, 1739 Northeast 14th Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item S3221 Northeast 14th Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item W5015 Northwest 16th Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item AA722 Northeast 34th Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item double E, 1000 Southwest 55th Street, we ask that that be stricken, we need to re-notify. And item GG, 401 Northwest 90th Street, we ask that that be stricken, again, the owner has secured. Are there any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, we'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. We have a motion and a second. We have a presentation this morning. Eric's just going to go over the quiet zone and, and, and talk a little bit about the schedule and, and, and again, the uh, funding sources that were approved by previous council resolution. Okay. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So MFA item A this morning is the preliminary report for Project MC422, the sealed railroad safety corridor, also known as the quiet zone. And so this isn't the first time that you've seen this, but this will actually be the first formal report or plan brought to you for consideration. So to, as a reminder of the quiet zone, we, we've been working for some time, um, an arrangement and agreement to fund and also a schedule to move this forward. This is going to allow from Northeast 16th Street to Southeast 23rd Street to potentially create a quiet zone, whereas the trains will not have to blow their whistle through the downtown area. Um, there's a number of items that are included in the report and one that you will find most probably interesting is it will go intersection by intersection outlining the actual improvements that will be done. So to do the quiet zone, we have to protect those intersections and they can be done in about three different ways. One is a closure. The second is to add some restrictive medians that will keep cars from actually driving in an S pattern around the two gates to actually get through if there were an oncoming train. And then the third option is actually to install quad gates, which is a pair of gates that come down that just physically will not allow a car or a vehicle to pass through. So each of those is outlined in this report. Um, you'll see those included. Um, the funding plan was previously approved by the city council last summer. Um, and so the work has been completed by Cardinal Engineering. And we do have Steve Mason also in the audience today, um, the engineer that's doing that. The funding is broken up into several categories. Um, it's a $3.9 million project that's going to be funded partially by o Oklahoma City Economic Development TIF funds in the amount of $1.7 million. The MFA is funding the soft costs or the engineering portion at $185,000. There's general fund, that would be the Ward 6 fund balance that was approved also as a part of the funding plan last summer in the amount of a half a million, and then there's also an estimated half a million in private funds. Um, there's two phases to the project, but it does total up to $3.9 million, and that's also included in the report. The schedule is upon your approval this morning. This report would then be complete. It will allow us to then move forward and work with the BNSF to finalize their plans. Now, BNSF actually would do the majority of the construction that's related to the track construction. The city's not authorized to do that work, so a part of the funding plan is to pay the BNSF to do work. Now, they have given the city a discounted rate, so they too are very interested in this quiet zone proposal. And so we're, we're seeing a, a very good cost of their typical construction, um, which is included. We expect we can finish the final plans later this year. We can then make those final applications to the Federal Rail Association, the FRA, and then we hope that we can actually construct and complete the project in 2015. 
So with that, again, the report is attached. Um, it does include some of those basics, and if there's any individual questions on, say, an intersection, we can look at those as well. Okay. Questions for Eric? Yeah, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Eric, when do you think the project will be completely finished? By the end of 2015. End of 2015. That'll go from where to where? Basically from the uh, northeast 16th to southeast 23rd. Okay. But essentially, there's nothing north of 16th till you get to Wilshire. I guess it is Wilshire. So there's going to be a, a, the a quiet pretty, zone will be longer than it'll, it'll in, in essence be quite a bit longer than that, right? Yeah. Okay. And I think Eric, if I could point out, I think the private money is about six hundred and forty thousand dollars. I think it right continues now. to climb. I think what we presented in the funding last year was about five hundred, yeah. and I'm sure much more has been received. Okay. All right, Eric. Thank thanks. You. We have a motion and a second on the MFA. Any other comments or questions? Your Honor, I have a quick yeah, question on, on item uh, G.2. Uh, this is a, a workman's comp claim, uh, and a, it says in the write-up, and I'm not sure this is germane to the major issue or not, but that's my question, the, clim the claimant also suffered a heart attack and psychological overlay. Uh, does this particular item settle all those issues? So, or is he, he's resigned now, the employee is resigned. Is, can he come back and, and claim some additional medical assistance because of his heart attack and psychological overlay? I do not know that. Um, maybe Craig, well, oh, there's Craig Freeman. Yes, this, this should address everything that's listed within the memo. It should, but does it? Yeah, yes, it does. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> it addresses everything that's within the memo. Okay, yes. thank you very much. That's right. <laughs> yes, any other comments or questions on the MFA? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. We have five items. All right, comments or questions on the PPA? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Three items. Comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Are there any individual considerations? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, huh? 6BD. All right. Anybody else? Ed? BZ. BZ. All right. Your Honor, uh -huh. item 6AB2. Okay. Your okay. Honor, uh, A, uh, Alpha X ray. Okay. And uh, Alpha uh, Montreal point two. And uh, Alpha uh, Hotel, and then uh, S Sugar. All right, John, you want to get started with B and D? All right, or thank B, you, Miss. Oh yeah, Pat. I'd like to add Sorry. A C B? and A Z. A C and A Z and A Z. Okay, <laughs> John. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to point out six B D. Uh, is a joint project between uh, the city of Oklahoma City and Oklahoma County. Uh, as you recall on last year, uh, each council member had a uh, million dollars to spend, uh, and so I'm spending $800,000 uh, of the one million uh, to do 10 lane miles uh, in the eastern part of Ward 7. This again, uh, the location is Northeast 50th Street from Post Road to Westminster, which equals one mile. Uh, Northeast 63rd Street from Post Road to uh, Henley Road, uh, four miles, which gives us a total of 10 lane uh, miles. Again, this is a joint uh, project with uh, Oklahoma County. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, John. Ed, B2? BZ. BZ, yeah. My BZ, for. Uh, Many years, members of the Vietnamese uh, community have uh, worked to put a monument in, uh, in Military Park, uh, none more than uh, Ben Nguyen, who's here in the audience. Um, some may have been here a number of years ago. There, there was a, uh, an attempt that, that didn't work out. There were some things in that that aren't included in this, like renaming a street and things like that. But uh, a proposal was submitted about nine months ago 
We've had several meetings over the last year with Wendell and other members of city staff. Um, the, the idea is that members of the Vietnamese community would raise roughly 250000 for a monument commemorating the uh, uh, effort in the uh, Vietnam War and also a, a symbol of the commitment to the city. Uh, there's a flag, uh, multiple flag, uh, as part of the monument. The, um, this would be incorporated into the master plan as part of the GEO bond, the 2007 GEO bond. There's money for reconstruction of Military Park. It says 650,000, I thought it was 800,000, we'll have to clarify that, but uh, the idea would be to incorporate the monument into uh, the revamping of Military Park. Uh, this was brought to the Parks Commission in October and passed. It was brought to the Arts Commission and passed in December. The city's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs would administer the art selection process, put together a stakeholder group. There is a design, um, Several of you have seen it, but there's a design in mind for the monument. But again, the city's office for arts and cultural affairs would administer the process. What they need this resolution today to then take to donors to begin to raise money, uh, and then we would we would try and work over the next year uh, in a way to incorporate the design of the monument once that process has been uh, completed uh, and incorporated into the master plan at the same time. So we're not raising money for a monument, putting the monument in, and then trying to do the reconstruction afterwards. So this resolution is, is uh, a statement in principle that we would accept this $250,000 donated monument. Great, great project. Mr. Wynn, thank you for coming today. Um, David, AB2, or is that ABZ? No. I can't read my handwriting today. My AB2. twos are looking like Zs. Yes, sir, thank you. Just wanted to thank uh, City Manager Couch and the staff for putting together a bid that will be uh, sent to the Association of Central Oklahoma Governments, ACOG, uh, to hopefully obtain a four to one match that will allow us to make uh, pedestrian improvements along I-240. And uh, if we are successful in transforming this back from a, an automobile-based uh, retail area to a pedestrian based uh, retail area or a more pedestrian friendly area. I think this will be a tremendous accomplishment. It reminds me of some of the great stories that came out of OU's placemaking uh, conference uh, now almost two years ago. Uh, an area that was created during the early 60s designed for automobile uh, to conduct uh, retail sales is now being transformed to make it a more pedestrian friendly area. I am very supportive of this uh, effort and again thanks to the staff for putting together the proposal. All right, thanks David. Pat, AX. Uh, AX is a project in Ward 8 um, and it has to do with a, a, about a half mile of road construction. And the thing that got my attention on this was the number of uh, amendments and change orders on this particular project that increased the price of, of, of the total project to 14.83% above the, uh, uh, the initial bid. And there was one in here that was even worse than that. I think it was up to 35%, but it wasn't Ward 8, so I didn't get involved. In it. Um, do we have and should we have some kind of a limit? I guess do we have or should we have? some kind of limit that we can do under this kind of process. It seems like that uh, there's at some point in time we ought to be able to stop these and, and look at them and see if there's something that we've missed or something that was included that shouldn't have been included or if it is included we need to justify it rather than just do this change order project process. Doesn't the system itself kind of lend itself to that though? Because we bring them back, I agree with you. There ought to be some limit, but once you make, once you're under, under, and you need to finish the project, I think the system we have now, where it's brought back to us like right now, works pretty well. So I think just as a comment from from the Public Works Department, one of the things that we struggled with is we had limited the use of change orders and amendments periodically, and what we found was that contractors weren't being paid timely if we waited a month or two and assembled a change order. 
We also found that there was just a lack of information when it was time to prepare that document. So to answer why there are so many on a project, we're actually proposing that during construction, we may do as many as one a month just to take care of quantities. Now, sometimes that may increase the quantity or decrease, and I think you'll see on your agenda there's some decreases sometimes as well. I think as for the percentage, and I need to look at this one more specifically, but sometimes what we find is there's just additional work that we find that could be done under this contract and out of convenience, we add it. We could bid it as a separate project, but in some cases that could delay some work. But I can follow up a little bit more on this one and find out specifically why it was 14%. Well, and I think one of the other things that's out there is, uh, although there's a lot of change orders, we're doing a lot of projects, and, and, and you know, a, a million, two million dollar project is fairly routine for us, but that's a big deal to a contractor, and, and you know, a, a, a whatever the change order amount is, is something that, that they want, and they want us to, to respond to their change orders, they want to know that it's going to happen, and that they get paid for the work that they've been done, that's been done. Well, as long as there's a, a, a consistent and impartially you review process in place, then maybe my concern has been answered. But I wanted to make sure that we were looking at these to make, you know, to see if there was some point in time at which we just need to step back and say, okay, we need to redesign this or we rethink our. Well, Eric, what are the, give, give us two or three common reasons a change order would take place to begin with, because we have a plan when we start and then there's a change. So what are, what are the common commonalities and in, in why a change takes place? You know, I think sometimes we just have just an error in the plans where a quantity was estimated at, say, 10,000 units and it ends up being 15,000 units. Um, it's just an oversight early in the process and we find out during construction we needed just a little bit more. That's probably the most common and that's what you'll see is when we adjust pay quantities those are actually amendments to the contract and not change orders. What makes those a little easier to pallet is the fact that they were competitively bid and not negotiated prices. So they were bid against other contractors for that price. We're just buying more of it or less of it. An example on, on the Mass for Kids projects, we've had a lot of change orders that were owner requested items, the school district requested, of things when we bid the project out, we didn't know whether we were going to fund it or not because we didn't know if we'd have, we'd have enough money. So we bid them out as alternates and we didn't award all the alternates. We get to the end of the project, and there's we haven't used many change orders, so we we go ahead and add some of those alternates back in, maybe up to our change order limit, because it was all good stuff that brought value to the school. But at the time of the award, we didn't want to we didn't want to extend ourselves yeah. too far out in, in, into the budget and leave, leave not enough. Well, you don't want to overpromise. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you, so, you, uh, Jim you used the, the phrase up to our change order limit. Is there a limit? Yes, ten percent. 10% under, under change orders. Yes, sir. So now, all, not, not on amendments. Amendments, amendments, are uh, amendments can, you, you can go beyond that. But for change orders, it's 10%. But my concern, I guess, is basically, when you get to the, cut all the, the chaff away from what I'm saying, is that are we accepting low bids and then having it made up in the... Yeah. An example of where we set back and rebid a project, there's been a couple of those. One, it, it, and, and the schools are, I think, better examples of that because they're, they're, they've just been not cookie cutter. I mean, when it's street projects, it's pretty much unit prices and such. Water uh, projects are pretty much unit prices. But uh, Emerson, we cut back part of that project and stopped it and, and, and did a second bid package on that. We did the same thing with class and SAS, where, where we, we were too, too far into it and there's parts of it and we just, we just cut off the scope of work because of the, the phasing and whatever had to be done. We cut it off and rebid it at a later date. Those are two examples of where we have done that. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Pat, you also want to talk about I, I had a question on that. James. So th this isn't a case where the the contractor who wins the bid is underbidding and then coming back and asking for more money. I, I think that's kind of at the heart of this issue, I, and yeah. I didn't really hear that answer. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. No, and and so the, you know, on our on our typical contracts, I mean, it is a hard bid on a set fixed quantity. I mean, there isn't room for the contractor to really err on these unit price contracts. So the, the answer is no. And so even if, say, the contractor who had the highest bid, the highest amount of bid, they would probably they would more than likely come back with these exact same change orders and amendments if they if they had been awarded and. In the case and not of, the lowest bid. Right. In the cases of these or these amendments, th that would exactly be the case is yeah. either we increased or we decreased a bid quantity. The change orders are negotiated, and much like what Jim mentioned, we sometimes do add extra work through negotiation that wasn't a bid item, but those are far less than the total 14 percent. The 14 that's on this is all change orders and all amendments that are on this particular project. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Pat, you had some others listed, I believe. Uh, AH, uh, this has to do with some traffic signal improvements in the downtown area. And I was curious if we had rethought our 
practice on walk signs. Since we are trying to narrow these streets and slow the traffic down. And uh, we have walk signs now that I think are uh, a false sense of security to the pedestrians sometimes because there's turning traffic that uh, puts the pedestrian at risk as he steps out there with a walk sign. And, and some cities I've been visited why the walk sign stopped all the traffic while the, pre the pedestrians go across the street. Uh, um, great question about that. We've looked, at, look, looked at, at those options down there. We have not gone into the, the, the all-stop pedestrians cross it, which is done from time to time. You know, there are, uh, you know, especially with Project 180, with, with the signals that are going in down there, there's clearly pedestrian uh, lights that go in. If you've got a protected left turn lane, then the pedestrians aren't supposed to go and you don't have the clearance to do that. If it's not protected, you know, the, the vehicles are supposed to yield on that and the pedestrian does have the, have the right of way. Um, and so we're following the manual, manual uniform control devices. As, as, as I'm as sure there's something that we're following, but it seems to me that, it, that we are providing a sort of a false sense of security sometimes mm -hmm. when we have a walk sign. Well, coming. Pat, are you talking about on left turns and protecting? I'm talking about all the, the entire system we have is to me flawed in that we allow some traffic to go through that intersection at the same time we have a walk sign. And uh, I just think that's misleading to the pedestrian. That's just. Maybe I'm simple-minded. I mean, we don't have people crossing. We don't have cars crossing an intersection when there's a walk sign up. We have cars turning. In, 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 okay, on, on protected left turns and non-protected left turns, yeah. Or even making and right, right turns. Or turning right, right yeah. which is, you know, that's tough to stop people sometimes. I, yeah, I, I agree with that. Well, anyway, I just, and I think uh, further, further on this, we've got some walk signs in, in, in our uh, suburban areas that make no sense at all because there are no sidewalks leading up to the walk signs. And we have walk and don't walk signs flashing back and forth, and there's no sidewalks. There's no way the protesting to get to the intersection. So. I'd be happy to look at any specifics you've got on that. Hefner Road and MacArthur. Okay, great. Uh, item AM2 is a, is a, a contract we're awarding to a, a company to clean out some, uh, some channels, drainage channels. And, and here we say clean, uh, channel cleaning and maintenance. What kind of maintenance do we do? And we have, uh, all, uh, is required on that contract. Thank you, Councilman. We have multiple channel cleaning contracts, and monthly the contractor goes out and visits the locations that they're under contract to do. If they notice grass any taller than 18 inches, they've got to remove that grass and cut it down lower. If they find any debris in the channel or limbs that are hanging, they have to remove those as well. So they basically do maintenance and cleaning of the channels that are under those particular contracts. But do they, if, for instance, if, if the channel has been uh, is failed due to bad construction or some other I, I, uh, reason, are they responsible for repairing the channel? So they wouldn't do any capital improvement work, no. So if we find that there's a crack in a concrete channel liner or a failed um, erosion control thing, that would be something they'd bring to our attention and then we could plan a project accordingly. But no, they don't repair those. And, and we, we don't have any drainage money, so we just plan these projects and add them to the list. We, we do struggle with, with funding for some of our future drainage projects. Um, we obviously are keeping a, a list of priority projects so that when resources are available, we can address those as quick as we can. Thank you. And item S, I was just curious, uh, we're de uh, declaring 100 gallons of paint surplus and we're donating it to the Neighborhood Alliance paint houses with, first two questions really, where did we get the 100 gallons of paint that was surplus? Why did we buy it in the first place? Secondly. Is it legal for us to donate it to anybody? Can we get, make donations? So if I might respond, the, the paint was actually deposited at our household hazardous waste facility as a, as a household hazardous waste. And I think as we presented um, with our budget presentation, if you donate an item at the Oklahoma City facility, we actually have a small store there that uh, if you donate, you can take items for free pesticides, paint, other products. In this case, we just simply have a surplus of paint that we would normally get rid of through our, through our normal process. Um, and we have Which would be a contract where we'd pay people to take it away from us. And in this case, we have a 100 gallon request for, for, for home remodel. And we did this last year with, with great success. And so we're basically returning that to you for your consideration today. That, uh, Do we monitor the colors of that donated paint so we don't get odd colored houses in there? That's OK. I forget it. No. Forget the question. All right. Uh, Pete, I think you're next. Kelly Corbin.
AC is a, um, is a resolution authorizing uh, the uh, uh, National Register nomination for a building called the Kelly Club on North Kelly. Um, I just wanted to just bring, bring that to the attention of everyone. That, that building has saved many, as many lives as some hospitals, and it's a, it's a wonderful organization. It's been an AA club headquarters for years and years and years, and I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that it's going to get some recognition for that. Okay. Mayor? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't ask, but would it be all right if I talked about AD and E? Sure. Briefly, um, AD, to follow on Pete's um, comments, is a nomination uh, request for the uh, Fred Jones Manufacturing Plant at uh, 900 uh, West Main Street. And that also will uh, hopefully uh, place that on the National Register of Historic Places. And then um, item AE is another project in Ward 6, and it's a resolution approving an allocation of our home program funds for the construction of 200 units of uh, single room occupancy housing on the corner of the West Town uh, campus over at Fifth and Virginia. And uh, this is really an integral part of our um, 100,000 homes project with the Homeless Alliance to provide safe and secure housing for really truly the most difficult um, folks on the streets to house. And so this is a, a terrific kind of conclusion to that piece of the campus. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on the consent docket? Did Pete have a Z? Z. Okay. And um, is, the, is the bridge in, we're talking about, is it the small bridge on Douglas? Or is it the is it the larger bridge, east west of there on 149? So this this is work that's complete. So this bridge has been rehabilitated under our unit price contract. And the reason for the partial acceptance is that we anticipate additional bridges to also be performed. But this one's complete, which is why it's here today. No, what I'm asking is, which, where is it? It's right. I I personally have not seen it, but it. The memo is listing it at Southeast 149th and Douglas. So it's probably, it could be just a series of boxes and not look exactly like a bridge, but it would probably have a channel crossing right at that location. Well, there's a bridge immediately south of 149th Street that is one of those old-fashioned county bridges that when you couldn't go straight across on the section line, it, it jogs. It's a, it's a, it goes at an angle to the road. There was a death there about a year ago, um, and the bridge was pretty well torn up. but. Uh, and it needed to be rebuilt because people that live south of there need, a, need access back into that area since Douglas is close to the north. I think we're talking about that. That needs to be put on the project, though, to change that situation. I mean, that's a, that, you cannot fix a bridge like that for it not to be very, very dangerous. It's just not, it won't, you know, it's just, it's, it, you have to curve. You have to, it's a one lane bridge that you have to actually make a jog to the right or to the left, depending on which direction you're coming from. And it's, it's dangerous. You can't, I'll, I'll be happy to put it on a that. list for future consideration. And, and I, I appreciate the fact that it was rehabilitated, you know, but, but it, we're rebuilding something that really needs to be replaced. And it would be very expensive to do. It's a wide chasm there where the creek runs underneath it, but it's dangerous. It is very dangerous. You know, we're anticipating a bond issue in the next several years, and I think with that, we can add a project like this to that list for consideration. Now, the other consideration is we're, we're buying land now on 164th, a mile south of there today, to, uh, to build a fire station, and, and the access for the fire station to the north will have to go a mile to, will have to go west rather than east because that bridge is too dangerous to take a fire, fire truck across, in my opinion. Big, a big, large truck. So, anyway, it ought to just be, you ought to look at it because okay. it's, a, it's a very dangerous intersection. Thank you. A bridge, I mean. Thank you. All right, ready to vote the consent docket? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. On to the concurrence docket, 25 items today. Any comments or questions here? All right, looks like we're good to go. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Moves us to item eight. These are items that require a separate vote. We start with a series of zoning cases. The first is at 8A1. It's in Ward 2 at 615 West Wilshire. 
And Ed, we have one person who has signed up to speak. Uh, who's the, is that the? They're in support. Okay, I guess we can hear them first. All right, uh, Jeff Swanson. Hello, my name is Jeff Swanson. I live at six, uh, 1607 Dorchester Drive here in Oklahoma City. Uh, just tell you very, very briefly about Wilshire Gun. Uh, contrary to a couple of reports, we are not seeking to open a bar at all. In fact, we will not have any bar on the premises at Wilshire Gun. What we are is a $6 million facility here in Oklahoma City, opening a state-of-the-art indoor gun range, uh, in fact, entire event center. Uh, that has the state's only 100-yard indoor lanes, 35-yard lanes, 25-yard lanes. We have archery. Uh, we have classrooms for uh, myriad curriculum uh, that uh, standardizes the safety uh, that's what's paramount and fundamental to Wilshire Gun. We have corporate event center, a private club, and we also have the Range Cafe. Within the Range Cafe, uh, we have asked for an ABC2 overlay. Uh, and it's very, very important to note that at Wilshire Gun, uh, you will never be allowed to uh, have a drink first and then go shoot. Uh, just the opposite. What we encourage is for you to come to Wilshire Gun, come to any of the ranges. You check in with the range safety officer who greets you at the door. Uh, if you so want to shoot, then you go to the range desk and check in at that point. Uh, once you've checked in, your driver's license is scanned. With all 50 states, you know you can scan the back of a driver's license. Uh, take that in with you. And uh, if your lane's not immediately up, you can go over to the Range Cafe and get a bite to eat. You will, of course, be advised that if you decide to order a drink, you are, your driver's license is scanned again by our state-of-the-art uh, scanning facility and, and point-of-sale system. You are then red flagged and not allowed within any of the shooting facilities for the remainder of the day, either as a shooter or as a spectator. We have an absolute zero tolerance for any drinking uh, before you've been shooting uh, whatsoever. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, we, we feel strongly that what we're doing and bringing to Oklahoma City is something that is not only local and regional, but brings national attention with the competitive uh, shooting on a national level that's coming in, but also uh, for the corporate events that we've done. And it is those corporate events in particular uh, that is very, very helpful to be able to have this ABC to overlay uh, to attract the type of, of local and regional and even national events and corporate members that we want to bring here to Oklahoma City. Uh, but beyond just the scanning system, please understand that all of our employees are trained to standardized field sobriety testing measures. Not only that, but we also uh, have a psych nurse on consult so that all of our staff knows to watch for any type of a red flag whatsoever, not simply the scanning of a drug of a driver's license, but anything, any signs of stress or anxiety, depression, anything that would create a concern. And a range safety officer will immediately take you, question you, uh, move you to the side where management will decide whether or not uh, you are fit to be a shooter at all. But, but you'll never be able to drink and then go to the ranges in any way, shape, or form. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions on this, but please understand that the majority of our staff are either current or former military or law enforcement personnel. They're very, very aware of everything involved in this. We have a $6 million investment, and we're not, allowed, not about to allow anything to go wrong here and jeopardize that investment. Uh, we've come to you with approval, but after this, we still have to go to the ABLE Commission and other regulatory actions to ensure that what we're doing is as safe as any other restaurant where you can currently open and carry a firearm right now and have a drink. But, but with what we've included, we're safer than any other restaurant that we can imagine anywhere in the country. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions from council or? Oh, Larry. yeah, and I have a comment. Uh, we have alcohol is legal in Oklahoma. Guns are legal in Oklahoma. Uh, I have a real problem with mixing them, too. And so as a result, respectfully, I'm going to have to vote no. Yeah, David. <clears throat> the uh, safety measures that were identified I think go well beyond what we find in other shooting facilities. You know, unfortunately, there's been instances where people have gone into facilities uh, excluding alcohol. 
and have been able to obtain a firearm and then went on a, uh, uh, a shooting spree, I think their safety measures go beyond and make this safer than what you find in other uh, shooting facilities, uh, both here locally and throughout the country. So uh, with, with the efforts that they've identified that they'll have in place, I don't see an opportunity to mix alcohol and the uh, firearm shooting. Uh, I'm not concerned about that. I'm, I'm concerned uh, in general with uh, these type of gun ranges to where people can access them and there's no super or there's very little supervision. People aren't available to monitor who they're checking guns out to other than say a clerk uh, like you find in other types of retail facilities. Those gun ranges I think are more susceptible to uh, having problems than this one. Thank you. May, may yeah, I ask Meg. a question? Um, is, this a pri is the whole thing a private membership organization or is the club private? No, we are open to the public and the Range Cafe is open to the public as well. Uh, we're trying to extend the western corridor uh, just a little bit to the north and uh, there in Ward 2 and actually bordering on Ward 7. We do have a private club level to it. Uh, but no, the, the Range Cafe is open to the public, you bet. Uh, and one important thing to note, um, in case you're not aware, there are ranges like this all over the country right now. Uh, the reason that you may not be aware of gun ranges that do currently sell alcohol, beer, after you've shot or otherwise, is that we've not been able to find any incident of anything involving these two mixing ever in the history of our country. I, this dates back to late 1800s uh, in New York has one, California has one, Arizona, Texas, Kentucky, Georgia, uh, the states are on and on, but, but those that do it, do it right. And we think we've taken the best of all of those ranges and have even added our own spin on it to take it to a much higher level. This is through local and national consultants that have helped us put together what we feel is the safest policy imaginable. Yeah, John. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm all for gun rights. Um, but I think this is the, the wrong location, given uh, the location of the facility in the uh, neighborhood. That's the North Highlands uh, area. Um, so uh, to mix alcohol and guns together uh, in that neighborhood, um, I just totally disagree with. Okay. Any other comments I, or questions? I have, I have yeah, a question. James. Can you kind of describe some of the physical care? physical barriers, if there are any, between the cafe and the range area? There are, absolutely. Uh, in fact, when you come in, the, the cafe itself is directly to uh, your right. Uh, and that's where you come in, you see menu boards. Then you actually go around a corner uh, behind yet. Another, you've, you've already been greeted by a range safety officer. And then you would go actually the point of sale within the cafe area, separated by railings, staircase, other walls, and, and uh, and the like just for the small cafe area. As you can tell, the cafe itself is less than 8% of the total 40,000 square footage of Wilshire gun. But you're kept within that area and you're not allowed beyond the area where we've asked for an ABC2 overlay to have a drink at all. And again, once you've had a drink, you're red flagged, lock out of the system completely for the remainder of the day. Um, even our lead abatement, everything associated with this is complete state of the art. It's an expensive facility to do it right, to do it to this standard of safety for lead abatement, the range safety officers, all the personnel, the training completely. Uh, but we can't imagine in any way that uh, there'll be anything other than a strict zero tolerance policy and that the two will never mix here. But also, I mean, you, you said the zero tolerance thing quite a bit. Why, um, because the, adding the ABC element to it seems to make the zero tolerance even harder. Like what is the, what is the motivation? Like why would you want to make that, that harder? Well, we, what we've built, and this, this investment is not without recognition that we, we hope to and has already been proving to with some of our bookings to bring in national events uh, of a corporate nature, of a competitive shooting sports nature and otherwise. And we strongly feel that having an ABC2 overlay allows us then in these safe, confined areas to host the corporate events like you would expect from Chesapeake or AEP or Devon, uh, the Cowboy Hall of Fame, others who have been contacting us wanting to have 
local events at our place as well as bring in national events and, and host them there. Um, as events you've probably gone to before, having a, a, an area that is able to serve socially responsible limited drinking is inclusive in trying to get that done. So, so you, you think that getting those sorts of events is, is kind of hinges on, on serving alcohol? Yes, yes. In fact, we've been told that by events, and, and we, get, we get calls all the day as we get closer and closer to opening. I find that hard to believe, but um, I can accept it. All right. Are we ready to go? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, this past planning commission, it's, uh, I, I toured it yesterday. I, it is a state-of-the-art facility. I, I understand the, the apprehensions. I, I'm not sure on what legal ground the city could deny this application. We, we do live in a state where guns and alcohol are mixed. I, I walked through H&8, and people have open carry, and there's beer everywhere. You can... As he mentioned, open carry uh, in any restaurant with beer. Um, you know, something that's, that's perhaps much more dangerous and causes more, much more harm to society than guns and alcohol is alcohol and driving. And the, uh, without having any public transit in the evenings, I think we all know that, that we have bars throughout the city, throughout our neighborhoods, where, where drinking and driving, people dry, drink alcohol and they get, get behind a one, two, three, four ton vehicle. Uh, that is a, a, a weapon uh, of sorts. And so I think that other bars perhaps would learn from some of the security measures uh, that, are, that are being instituted. I, I do believe it is much less likely to have drinking and driving from somebody leaving this facility. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure on what legal ground, and, and Kenny's not here, uh, that you could deny this application uh, with everything that's in place. Uh, and so I'm going to move for approval. We have a second. Cast your votes. The motion carries 6-3. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We're on item 8A2. It's a zoning case in Ward 7 at 1221 Southeast 30th Street. A few other places, too. It's currently our one single family, and it would become an I-2 moderate industrial district. John? All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It has, uh, do we have any protests? No protests. I see the applicant is present, and I see her attorney uh, is here. Uh, typically, uh, the applicant always wants me to vote no on different things, so it's good to see that you here <laughs> wanted me to support something. Uh, so I do move for uh, approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on item 8A2? Cast your votes. It passes. John? <laughs> Unanimously. <laughs> item 8A3 is a zoning case in Ward 8. The address is 13121 Northwestern. It's currently R1 single family residential and some limited and general and community commercial districts. And it would become a new plan unit development. Pat? Your Honor, thank you. And I, if I support this, I will vote for it. Um, this is a, a area that's been under development for several years. Several developers have come in and tried to do it. It's a big area. There are some problems out there. But I think uh, the current development team, uh, I see uh, the representative was here just a minute ago. There he is. And uh, it, I think it's a, it's, it's a good addition to that part of the city. There's uh, already some construction out in that area. And I think it's uh, going to be a, a, a good development. Like I say, mm -hmm. it's been under consideration for several years. It's taken on different characteristics. It's gone forward. I think what's worked out now is, is a good one. Uh, and, and Bob, I understand there were some TEs, and they've agreed to all of them. That's correct. There was one on the front page of your memo that was deleted. But other than that, they agreed to everything. I move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, Kelly Work has signed up to speak. Kelly, you okay? You want to go ahead and vote? Yes. Sir. All right, we'll go ahead. I, and vote. I actually do have a yeah, one gotcha. question, and it's not real. It's in the in the PUD. It talked about uh, garden style apartments are prohibited, and then it gave the description of what garden style apartments are. And to me, that's just apartments. So I was trying to figure out what exactly apartments are going to go there, and it's just ma mainly for my knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, what, what 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 are non garden style apartments? Yes, thank you, Councilman. Uh, 
Mr. Mayor and members of the council, my name is Kelly Work and I'm here representing the applicant for this PUD. <clears throat> that was an issue that was um, presented by the members of the Planning Commission. The concern was that uh, there was quite a lot of residential that is being allowed under the terms of this PUD along with retail, office, restaurant, and entertainment venues. And the objective is for it to be a true mixed-use uh, urban style community. The concern was that, and there is a cap on the number, the total number of residential units that will be allowed under the terms of the PUD of 1,200 units. There was a concern that, uh, well, if we were to allow the PUD to be approved, then the possibility would exist if this development did not succeed that then all of that residential would be in place and we might just see uh, a, um, an influx and development of just strictly the residential apartments, multifamily apartments, that would be the, what in the industry is referred to as the garden style apartments where it's a, a three or four story walk up with surrounded by um, parking and all of the entries from to the individual units are exterior and the um, objective of the commission the concern of the commission and staff was that we we wanted to have some protection to prevent that from happening so the way that we have done that in the under the terms of this PUD is that we have included language that uh, that says that um, the residential has to go hand in hand with the office and the commercial. So we will be allowed to have one residential for each 500 square feet of uh, commercial that is developed, one residential unit for each 250 square feet of office or medical use that is established. And then we also put in a and language that would exclude, and this was difficult to arrive at this definition because it's kind of one of those, you know it when you see it, but it's difficult to try to put it down on paper. We did include some language to attempt to ex exclude the garden style apartments and the objective is there that we would have multifamily residential that would be more like what we see downtown where it's, uh, um, it's uh, close to the street, uh, the uh, it may still be three or four story, but the typically the it would be uh, dense. It would be access to the units above the first floor would be through interior hallways rather than exterior units. So it have more of an urban feel. The objective is for this development to be. Uh, pedestrian friendly and walkable so there'll be a lot of common areas it'll be they'll be hopefully close together so that to encourage walkability so that was the objective was that we wanted to we were allowing for the multifamily residential but we wanted to try to ensure that it would be more of an urban style like you're seeing east of Bricktown rather than the more spread out um, garden style apartments. So that was our objective and that's, that's we think we, we met that objective, but that's where we were trying to get to. Yeah, no, it, it, it seemed like it was good wording. I just didn't know what non-garden style apartments were. And uh, urban, an urban feel at 164th and Western, that, that's going to be a, I, I'm, I'm ready to see that. But well, it's so across the street from Quail Springs Mall, so it's Italy. Yeah. <laughs> well, the objective is for, for this really to be its own zip code and for people to have an opportunity to live and work and play in this area. And it extends from all the way from Western over to Pennsylvania. And it includes, this PUD includes uh, permission for the participant recreation use that will be um, top golf and so they're uh, eager and ready to get underway it will be located along the southern end along fronting on uh, western and um, that is um, going to be a very um, exciting attraction for Oklahoma City and they're uh, anticipating that they will be uh, under construction very shortly and that they plan to be open
by the spring of 2015. So that's a part of what uh, is included in, in this PUD. I'll be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Is, this is a proposed site for the Cabela's as well, or? Uh, the only uh, uh, occupant that has been publicly announced at this point is the uh, Top Golf. And they're in conversations with a number of national retailers, but the only one that there's been a, a public announcement of at this time is Top Golf. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And Your Honor, I'd like to ask for the emergency on this project. Okay. Voting on the emergency. Passes 9 0. Thank you, Your Honor. Item 8A4 is a planning case in Ward 8 at 14700 Hertz Quail Springs Parkway. It's currently a plan unit development and will become a new PUD if passed. Pat? Thank you, Your Honor. This is a project in an area that's already been heavily developed as office space already, so this will be consistent with what's going on up there or in, in, the, in the existing buildings right now. I would move approval. Second. All right, comments or questions on item 8A4? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A5 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 1803 East Britain Road. It's currently R1 single family when it become a new plan unit development. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Has anybody signed up? No one has signed up. Um, this uh, application is for uh, Kim Ray. I am uh, in 110 percent behind uh, this development, and uh, Kim Ray could have chosen to put their development in any part of uh, the city, but they decided to remain uh, in Ward 7. Uh, Kim Ray hires uh, a lot of people within uh, Ward 7. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a community meeting several uh, months ago uh, and saw uh, Kim Ray actively uh, uh, engage the residents uh, for this uh, facility. Uh, as you see, um, with uh, the information that has been provided, the majority of actually the protesters who submitted letters uh, have uh, basically withdrawn uh, their um, proposal, oh, excuse me, their, they basically have withdrawn their uh, protest. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Hill has been working with the protesters to address uh, all of their concerns. Um, with that said, I move for approval. Yeah, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8A6 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 3801 Northwest 164th Street. It's currently a plan unit development and would become a new PUD if passed. And I, I think I saw Tim, Tim Johnson is the representative of the owner. If there are any questions, we can ask Tim to go and answer those questions. Uh, if not, I would move approval. This is sort of an interesting development. It's in an area that is adjacent to or close to an og &E substation. Uh, and uh, it's uh, an area that's been slow to develop. They've been tried some things out there before and it hasn't gone over too big. But this is, I think, maybe an, a, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, an addition to out there that will capture the essence of what's required in that area. I would move approval. OK, we have a motion and a second on item 8A6. Any comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Your Honor. Item 8A7 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 11400 North Kelly. It's currently a plan unit development and would become a new simplified plan unit development if approved. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do we have anyone who signed up? Uh, is the applicant present? Can you please uh, explain uh, this course? Good morning, Barry Lodge, Red Rock Engineering, representing the applicant. Uh, this SPUD is uh, essentially it's a, a let's play indoor soccer facility that uh, currently the zoning is under a PUD. It's a O2 uh, zoning, and the the SPUD restricts the use to this one. Uh, use so uh, it's the the participant uh, recreation I believe is the way the the zoning is uh, is described but it would limit it to this uh, one specific use all right thank you I move for approval Second. 
We have a motion and a second on item 8A7. Any comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A8 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 3221 Southeastern Avenue. It's currently R1 single family residential and it would become a new simplified planning and development. John? All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is the applicant present? Um, do we have anybody who signed up? All right, I move for approval. Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 8A9 is also in Ward 7 at 3301 Southeastern Avenue, and it's uh, currently our one single family. It would become a new simplified planning and development. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Has anyone signed up? Nope. All right, I move for approval. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Item 8B is a zoning case in Ward 7. Uh, the address is 13501 North Bryant, and it's currently AA, and it would become a new plan unit development. John? All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Has anyone? Uh, signed up. No one has signed up. And I, first of all, I want to thank the, the Homeowners Association along with the developer and also Oklahoma uh, Christian. Uh, a few weeks ago, we was able to have a meeting um, where the residents uh, <clears throat> was able to work out their differences with the developer and also Oklahoma Christian. And thank you, uh, Oklahoma Christian, for uh, doing the right thing. Uh, so I do move for approval. All right, comments or questions on item 8B? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And also, Mr. Mayor, I ask for the emergency. Second. All right. Cast your votes on the emergency, and it passes 8-0. All right, thank you. Item 8C was deferred earlier. Is that June 10th? Is that the new date? Yes. Okay. Yes. Item 8C has been deferred until June 10th. Item 8D is a public hearing. This, is ha this has to do with the Capitol Hill Business Improvement District, and um, item 8D2 would be to adopt and confirm the assessment role. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on this item as part of the public hearing on item 8D? All right, how about a motion then? It's in Ward 4. Pete? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8D2. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And then item 8E is a companion item. This is just the actual ordinance for it. Pete, you want to make a motion there? Cast your votes there, and it passed unanimously. And uh, the, the emergency is appropriate, I think, on this, Pete. Do you want to uh, make a motion there? Because Francis says so. <laughs> it's, it starts the payment period on a specific date. It the clause is for a reason. It is not a gift that you give every applicant that comes forward. It's, there's a reason for the emergency clause. It defers the implementation of the, of the action to give the public, if they felt aggrieved, an opportunity to do something about it. We just give the emergency for everybody that's late, and I just want to be sure that's not why we're doing it here. Sounds like it's not. Okay, I move the emergency. All right, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Item 8F is a public hearing regarding some reserved parking, and this was introduced to council a couple of weeks ago. The public hearing is today. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under the public hearing item on 8F? All right, how about a motion then from council to move it forward? Cast your votes, and it moves forward. And same thing on item 8G. This is a public hearing regarding an item that was introduced to council two weeks ago. This has to do with the design district. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under the public hearing aspect? All right, how about a motion from council then to move it on? Cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. And item 8H is a public hearing for an item that was introduced a couple of weeks ago. It's kind of some housekeeping on our HP ordinances. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under this item? Okay, cast your votes on item 8H. I guess we need to vote 8H1 first. Looks like it. Okay, I'll take that motion then for item 8H1. Cast your votes on that. Passed unanimously. How about a motion now on 8H2? Cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. Item 8I is a new resolution today. It's going to be introduced to us, and I think Craig Freeman's here. Craig? Thank you. Um, this ordinance actually provides for the city treasurer to create 
five hundred dollar uh, petty cash accounts as departments needs the, need those. If it's going to be over five hundred dollars, then and we need that on an ongoing basis, then we have to create that within the ordinance. This provides for a two thousand dollar petty cash accounts for um, code enforcement and development services. It helps them when they get ready to get. It's a real cumbersome process right now to get their um, filing fees with the county, and the county doesn't accept our purchasing card, and so this will allow them more flexibility in getting and getting their filing fees. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Motion and a second. We'll be having a public hearing on this item June 10th, and then it's scheduled for final adoption by council on June 17th. We have a motion and a second today. This item introduced. Item 8I. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Item 8J is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8J? Yes, sir. Come on forward. No, you can come on forward. Yeah. Just step up to the center microphone here, if you would. Good morning. Good morning. I'll need your name and address for the record, please. My name is Erwin Johnson, and I'm here. Uh, to speak for my brother, Floyd Johnson, the property owner, and his son, Eric Johnson. Okay. Which and, property are you uh, concerned uh, with? P, address 11620 Northeast, 41st, 41st Spencer, Street. Oklahoma. Way out east on 41st Street? Yes. Oklahoma, All right. Ward 7. And uh, my brother's the property owner, but um, it's in, I doubt if he, he lives in Biggs, Oklahoma now. I doubt if he returned. But his, his children was raised there until their mother passed. And he's the son, Eric Johnson, was wanting to put the house up, not just because this deal. He had took action in April to, to move back. He had acquired a job where he's supposed to start working here for graphic printing in June. But he's a cross-country truck driver, and he hasn't been able to uh, uh, drop his truck off at a secure seat, uh, okay. location. And the company he hauls for also hauls for the company he's going to work for. And he said he figured he was going to have a problem because they said, if you can't re uh, report June the 1st, let them know. And he would like to get an extension so he can at least come and live, I mean, check it out. And he, but he was, his plans was to restore the house. And the house Have you looked at it very well? Have you looked yeah, at it closely? Yes, I looked at it. And he, he wanted me to come up with some uh, uh, what it would cost to restore it. And I, I seen the holes in the roof, and, and those holes in the roof is because about 22 years ago, my brother was replacing the roof when his wife died, and he just yeah. stopped working. I mean, it looks he, really bad. And he moved, moved away. Yes, yeah, so he wanted the stinker so he can come and look at it. He lived in, uh, in Tulsa, the son, but he's a uh, cross-country truck driver, and he's just been too busy for the last eight years to even, when he, his day's off, you know, he was just resting. And he would just like an extension so he could look at it and decide what he would like to do with it. Right now, he's in Alabama. I talked to him yesterday. Yeah. And he's, uh, he was supposed to be through working for Total Transportation last weekend. But yeah. they, I mean, our problem is that, that it's, it's a nuisance for the neighbors that live around it. It's yeah. not that we want to try to be you know, not sensitive to his personal issues and his work situation. John, it's in Ward 7. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like this item left on the um, on the docket, and if you can just work with staff, staff is going to uh, work with you all, but we need to definitely leave this on. Okay, uh, so the, the, I mean, the clock's ticking on this property. You, you or somebody needs to start working with staff about what you're going to do about it. Okay. It looks really bad. I don't, I don't, I don't see a, a, a way that he's going to be moving into this place anytime soon. And, uh, uh, but, but, uh, we, yeah, yeah, he's, he, he knew he was going to rent a place and get started. Yeah. Uh, also, it was another paperwork for the trash. His father and and brother came up Wednesday and removed all the trash that was behind the how people was going behind dumping. Okay. And hopefully uh, they was going to put up a fence and, and clean the place up. Originally the house was only a 20 by 20 house. The the east the west side that on the right hand side his father built all that new. You'd be surprised it's a totally different place. But you know his wife died and he just he yeah. just he moved to Biggs and started over Biggs Oklahoma and started over. But I guess his sons, you know, they was raised there, and they have fond memories of the neighborhood back in, uh, in the 80s. It was mostly, uh, they was the youngest couple, or most of the senior citizens, I guess, and he had a desire to move back and start over. And, well, and, and I, that's I, what that street needs, because all the 
all the citizens and left, and the whole, really the whole street is going down. But, yeah. well, I, I sympathize with the emotional ties he has to this mm -hmm. property, but we've got to have a, a solution yeah. to this in the next few days. So if you'll work with Charles on you know, some sort of plan about what you plan to do, and I think the idea okay. of perhaps fencing it and cleaning up the trash, all those are positive steps that we'll take into consideration. But don't let him think that this is just going to still be yes. there 60 or 90 days from now. It's not going to be. If, okay. he, if he doesn't do something in the next 30 days, then we're going to have to take action. On okay. It. okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure he will. All right. Uh, I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for coming down. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody else here to speak under uh, any other listed under dilapidated structures? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, mine is uh, 1700 Northeast 35th. Okay. And which property were you going to re referring to? Uh -huh. Oh. Okay, it's at yes, 1700 Northeast 35th Street. I will need your name and address for the record. Okay, Bobby Hartfield. My physical address uh -huh. is 8901 North McMillan Avenue. All right, thank you. And it's, it's in Ward 7. John? All right, thank you. Uh, Charles, what, what's your thoughts on, on this? Continue to leave it on and uh, work with, um, work with uh, Ms. Hartfield? Uh, we can do that, yes. Okay. Let's let's uh, if we we'll can just it leave it on. Yeah. If 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 um, what's your plan for this uh, house? Is this a rental? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If you can just work with uh, Charles, but well, we definitely going to have to have something uh, done with it. Staff is willing to work with you on it. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Thank yeah. you so Similar much. Similar situation, but you need to don't don't waste any time getting right. with our staff and working on it. Okay. All right. Thanks Thank very much. Thank you. Thank huh? you. Yes, and, and we will need your name and address for the record, please. Uh, hello, I'm May Spears, and my address is, well, now my post box, 607, uh, Nakama Park, 73066, because I never get my mail. By the time I get these uh, letters um, from the city about my property, well, then the time has elapsed, so that gives me very little time. So. For the record, if you all would get my post box straight where I can get my mail, because living in the country, people tear the mailboxes down. Well, let, let's get some clarification there. Is, does she need to go to the county to? to, to yes, she'd that? need yeah. to uh, address her uh, yeah. address concerns. So, so at we the get your address office. from the county. They handle all, all the records on that. So if you'll, if you'll give them a better address, that'll help us correspond with you more quickly. Okay, well now, um, the property I'm here about was 11,621 Northeast 41st Street. It was a house and a shed, but I've already cleaned that up. That's all, that's all cleaned up. Okay. Well, do we have pictures of that? Which one is it again? Your that's address item Q. Yes, we'll have. Those. That's how it was. Okay. Uh huh. But that's all cleaned up now. All right. Great. Is that the only property you're here to talk about? Yes. Okay. Well, our staff will go out, and if it's cleaned up, like you say, you shouldn't have any problems from us. Charles, is there anything else she needs to know? Uh, if it's cleaned up, we'll recheck it. it. Yeah. If it's, if it's cleaned up, you're good to go. Uh, but if, if, you know, if, if Charles has any f further issues, he's probably going to need a better way to correspond with you in the next 30 days. So you should probably give him a phone number or something where he can correspond with you in case there are any problems. Okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second on the uh, long list of dilapidated structures. Are we ready to go? Cast your votes. And it passes unanimously. Item K is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8K? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. And item 8K passed unanimously. Item 8L is a request for a right-of-way permit to hold H and 8th on the final Friday of each month from May to October of this year, and Brian Bergman is here to tell us more. Brian, come on down. Brian, you've had an early day. I saw you this morning. Yes. <laughs> this is, I had two interviews this morning on TV, and my morning started about 4.15. So, um, Brian Bergman, 500 Northwest 21st. I'm in Ward 6. I'm here to share about H and Eighth Night Markets happening uh, final Friday of every month um, on Hudson between Sixth and Ninth Street, and it also extends up Seventh Street between Walker and Hudson. Um, and really, 
it's, uh, it's kind of surprised us. Uh, you guys, probably everybody knows about it, and I won't give you the, the whole rundown, but through a little bit of uh, discovery, we've, we've found that this is currently the largest food truck event in the nation. Um, so uh, there's, it, it keeps surprising us, and uh, we're working, uh, uh, coordinating with the city as well as coordinating with the federal because of the uh, federal building right across the street from us. So uh, it's, it's been fantastic. So. All right. Well, we appreciate your success, and thanks for what you bring into the city. Meg, you want to make a motion? It's yes, I, I would make a motion. I just want to make sure with all those huge crowds, let's just keep everybody safe. Absolutely. It, it's gigantic. Absolutely. We're coordinating with federal marshals. Um, they're, being in, they've, they're involved as well as Oklahoma City police officers as well as private security. That way we always, one of our things that we're set out to do is to always remain family friendly. That's kind of one of our hallmarks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brian. It's really exciting to see how it's grown. I'd move approval. Cast your votes. And it passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8M is a resolution that will clarify a labor issue for us. Chief Jester is here this morning, I think, to explain this item. It has to do with the extension of the uh, sick leave donation program for a, a departmental captain. Good morning. Uh, on the sick leave uh, donation issue, we've got um, one of our captains, Dee Patty, um, has a very sick child, and um, she's been taking care of this child, and Captain Patty has run out, run out of leave time to care for her child, and I think our request is that um, other officers be allowed to you to donate leave time to her so she can care for her child. All right, this is item 8M. Okay, comments or questions here? Your Honor, uh -huh. how yeah. often uh, Chief Jester do you use this particular process to ask for an exception to the rule against donating sick leave? Um, this is the first time that um, I know of that we've requested to Thank do you. this. Okay. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Thanks. And item 8N is also a clarification on a labor issue. This has to do with acting pay for dispatchers in, in, in the 911 center. And we've recently changed our shift, shifting over there. And, and this is to accommodate uh, people that, that fill in for acting, for acting pay. Um, this issue has to do with uh, 911. And um, at that facility, we have to have supervisors. With the way that our current schedule works, it's been changed to where it's become more efficient, but one of the slight downsides to the new um, schedules is that sometimes we don't have a supervisor on duty, so we do something that's called an acting supervisor, where, where uh, one of the dispatchers uh, acts as a supervisor for us, which is necessary. Um, the contract allows for a uh, an acting has to do two shifts in order to be paid for uh, acting pay and we're requesting because it happens more often and because of the schedule change that we be allowed to pay a person who's worked one shift to be allowed to be paid that acting pay. How often is this happening Tom? Is this every week? Yes I think it happens on a regular Same basis so. now since we put that new schedule in place and as you remember from one of the prior councils it's, it's been very very successful and this is one of the tweaks that we have to do to to keep it going. Okay. Comments or questions here? Just uh, have you quantified um, what the cost might be? Um, I, I have not, but I can check and get back to you. Okay, just curious to see what the cost right. might be. I'm sure we, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have a second? Second. Voting on item 8N, passed unanimously. Item 8O is a salary continuation. I understand we do not need executive session here. Yes. Cast your votes. Resolution passes. And item 8P, I understand we do not need executive session, just a, a motion to pass. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8Q, uh, we do not need executive session, so a motion to strike would be in order. Okay. Cast your votes. Item is struck from the agenda. Item 8R, I understand we do need executive session, so yes, I'll look sir. for a motion to move it into executive session. Cast your votes, and item moves to executive session. Same story on item 8S. I understand we do need executive session here. Yes. Okay, cast your votes. That item moves to executive session. Item 8T is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8T? All right, how about a motion to move these on then? Cast your votes. Item 8T passed unanimously. 
Item 9 is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under item 9? Our item motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 10 is items from council. James, you have anything for us today? Ed? Larry? Yeah, just like uh, earlier, we had to do what Francis said. I have to do what Debbie Martin said. She gave me a note before, uh, as the council was going on. A uh, fire station 26, which was approved by the voters in the general obligation bond package back in 2007, uh, opened officially for operation Thursday, last Thursday on the 22nd. Uh, the amount of the uh, appropriation to build this fire station was $3.8 million. Uh, it will bring fire service to that southwestern portion of Oklahoma City uh, and give uh, faster response time to that. And the official ribbon cutting will be June 13th at 10 a.m. You all are invited to come to that also. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Pete? All right. David? Meg? John? Pat? Uh, Your Honor, I would like to pass on a comment made by one of my constituents about the uh, lane closings that exist in Oklahoma City right now. And uh, there seems to be a, a, a gap between the time the lane is closed and the actual construction. Could we see if we can get that as short as possible? Could you say it again? Well, we have a gap between the time we close the lane to, you know, to do a project okay. and the actual construction. And it seems like the, the lane is closed and closed and closed and then they start work on it. And my, the constituent was uh, upset about the fact that he was dis uh, inconvenienced because of that. We'd be happy to look at that. I, I know we'll review those regularly, but uh, that can happen. So I, I would be happy to look at that. All right. City manager reports. Um, I think we've got Mike Carrier here to give, there he is. Mike Carrier here is to give an update on uh, CVB activity this quarter. Good morning. Pleasure to be here with you again today and uh, talk about what's happening in the world of tourism here in Oklahoma City. Uh, the third quarter of this year was very strong for us. A uh, significant number of uh, events uh, beginning right out of the box at the, at the uh, first of the new year uh, with a number of conventions in January and February that brought uh, good business to the city. Uh, I know you all have seen some of the results uh, as it relates to our hotel bed tax and the continued increases there. Um, we are seeing significant uh, increases continuing uh, as we move through the end of the third quarter with the, uh, the new hotels that have come online, uh, particularly in downtown, but also uh, out in the uh, uh, Southwest 15th and Meridian area. Um, just a, uh, an anecdotal comment to that. Uh, during, the, during the first uh, four months, actually, this is through April, uh, we had seen 35,000 new room nights available in downtown Oklahoma City and had sold uh, 22,000 of those room nights. Uh, so the, the net result is a significant increase in the number of, of uh, new room nights generated downtown and citywide, uh, over, um, citywide right at 40,000 new room nights of business were sold during the first four months of this year uh, as compared to the same time last year. So uh, business continues to be very strong. Uh, the hotels that have opened are all uh, enjoying uh, reasonable success with, the, with new openings. We continue to see some additional hotels under construction. Uh, you know, and so we'll see uh, how all of that progresses. Um, the results that we're getting back from people who have been here for events like the NCAA wrestling championships, for other activities, continue to be very positive, very strong. Uh, people enjoy coming to Oklahoma City. Uh, we enjoy having their money spent here and seeing the, the results of their activities. Uh, We're getting good comments back from uh, folks like the NCAA, National Association of Sports Commissions, and others uh, who have said thank you for what uh, is being done here. We want to come back. We want to continue to bring events here. And so uh, things are going very, very well. Um, over the course of the next few weeks, we will have several uh, good activities going on. Obviously, Red Earth Festival is coming up. Uh, during that time, we will have about a half a dozen travel riders in town for a fam trip. These are folks who make their living writing stories about cities uh, and areas that they visit. Uh, we will be hosting several of those uh, during that time period. Uh, our social media outreach continues to be uh, significant. Uh, as we all see what's happening with the changes 
uh, in how people receive their information, uh, how they explore places that they might want to visit. Uh, social media and electronic media continue to uh, change the dynamics there and, and change, certainly change the paradigm of how we reach those folks. And so uh, we've taken some steps that have uh, created some significant increases uh, in the traffic that we're enjoying uh, on our Facebook, our Twitter, and other uh, relevant sites and the way that people uh, uh, receive that information. Uh, it's been interesting also to note uh, some things that have come out in the, the industry news lately. Uh, group business continues to be very strong nationwide. Uh, the increase uh, in, the, in the numbers, the increase in bookings continues to be uh, very good nationwide in terms of, of what's happening. Uh, we're also seeing things, uh, for instance, the, uh, the city of Denver has just completed a study uh, that is looking at what they need to do to improve uh, several of their facilities, uh, their convention center, which they expanded just a few years ago. Uh, again, potential expansion for that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Coliseum area where they have the National Western Stock Show, uh, some major improvements to that facility and the uh, potential increase in the National Western Show uh, that, uh, again, will provide us with some additional competition uh, for some of our livestock and equine shows in, in coming years. Um, we talk a lot about major events that come here, uh, the large uh, size events. Um, there's an event that was uh, just recently held here, 63rd year, the National Land and Range Judging Competition. And I know a lot of people kind of wrinkle their eyebrows and, you know, what's that? Well, it's FFA kids uh, from 34 states, including Hawaii, that were just here for three days. It's a long way from Hawaii to Oklahoma City to come in on a Wednesday and leave on a Friday. But we received a, a number of letters and thank you cards for our participation in that. The one that kind of struck me personally was from a little place called Floyd, Virginia. I'm from Bristol, Tennessee, which is about as far in the northeast corner of Tennessee that, as you can go. Floyd is about 125 miles northeast of there up in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, out kind of in the middle of... Uh, uh, it's not in the middle of nowhere, but you can see nowhere from there is, is kind of the way we talk about it. Uh, these kids drove 1,100 miles, Interstate 81 and Interstate 40 to get here, and wrote a very nice note about their time in Oklahoma City and thanking us for our participation. Just an example of the kind of things that go on here that don't necessarily get the, uh, the attention that we give to, uh, to folks like the Division I wrestling tournament but certainly makes an impact on young people uh, who are coming to Oklahoma City uh, now and hopefully will come here for years to come uh, and bring their kids and grandkids in future years as these types of events continue to happen. So things are very good. We are uh, on pace uh, in, uh, in our targets for the year. Uh, we fully expect to meet all of our targets uh, in terms of the number of events booked, uh, the room nights booked. Uh, we're well ahead of pace in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, um, tentative bookings that we have, and so we feel very good about the progress that we're making and uh, look forward to next fiscal year as we continue to move forward with the other aspects of the industry. Uh, we are getting ready to kick off the major horse show season uh, beginning this Thursday. The Red Bud Classic is the first of, uh, of a, a long string of significant horse shows that will be here, so I would encourage you to come out to the fairgrounds uh, just about any time between now and the 15th of December, and you'll see a whole lot of trailers and a whole lot of livestock and people from a whole lot of places around the country uh, and internationally here enjoying Oklahoma City. Uh, we, have, we also have the Women's College World Series uh, beginning this week. Uh, I have heard some great reports uh, about the, uh, the, the work that has been done at the, at the softball stadium. Uh, anecdotally have been told that the NCAA has already been there and taken a look and is very pleased with what they've seen. Thank you all for your continued support of that and other similar uh, activities. And so uh, the road to Oklahoma City for softball uh, is not over yet, but it's close. And the, uh, the folks that are following that yellow brick road will be here within the next day or so to begin their, their conquest of Oz. So 
And Mike, this morning the council approved the next phase of improvements, uh, or to, to put that out to bid for the next phase of improvements to the for the softball thing. Outstanding, and I know that the NCAA will be very pleased to hear that. And uh, you know, hopefully we're going to we're going to hear some positive things from them in the near future uh, about some uh, some other aspects of the NCAA Women's College World Series. So, thank you for your continued support for tourism. It's a it's a pleasure to be able to promote this city, to tell people about all the wonderful things that go on here. And it certainly makes our job easier when you have uh, uh, political leaders, civic leaders like we have here that uh, understand the vitality and the importance of this industry and continue to support it. So I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. But thank you for your, uh, yeah. for your continued activity. Mike, I had a, a couple of, of comments. I was able to attend a couple of sessions from the Big 12 baseball tournament. Can you kind of give us a, a reflection on how, you, how do you think the, the attendance was this year? Um, attendance looked to be a, a little bit better. I have not seen uh, final results and haven't had a chance to talk to Tim yet. Uh, I did have an opportunity while I was there to uh, visit with the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Bowlesby. Uh, he seemed to be very pleased with the way things were going here, uh, obviously pleased with the way that we continue to work uh, as a community with them uh, to present that event. Also, uh, you know, knowing that it's going to be uh, in another city next year for the first time in years. but. Uh, uh, his comments were that he, he continues to look forward to having that event back here as well as others. But um, obviously the rain, uh, which it's, it's a double-edged sword. We needed the rain and we're glad to get it. Uh, we wish that it had been at a few different hours than what it actually came. But uh, I thought it was impressive that a lot of our fans stuck around, uh, returned after rain delays. Uh, the, the Big 12 and the, the Red Hawks crew, uh, what I saw at least, uh, worked tremendously together to make sure that the field uh, was in the best shape that it could be in, uh, considering the weather, the weather conditions, and uh, it uh, it certainly appeared that uh, everything went very very well. So uh, I'm sure we'll get a, a better report within the next few days after uh, they have the chance to do the final tallies. Yeah, it, the crowd on Sunday looked extremely large. Nice crowd. It always helps to have a local team in the in the final. It certainly does, and. Uh, Tulsa has secured the event for 2015. We yes, have sir. the event in 2016. Correct. That's right. Okay. Correct. Ed? Looking through this 30-something pages, the only thing that was highlighted is you said a major challenge we experience regularly is the lack of a city-owned parks and rec operated sports complex. For example, both Edmond and Mustang have quality sports complexes and are out competing Oklahoma City for tournament business. It's our hope the city will begin looking at an opportunity to include this type of facility in a future development program, what? Well, things like Mitch Park and uh, in Edmond is a good example. There, there are a lot of cities around the country that have very active uh, softball programs and soccer programs. Ours here are much more privately operated. Um, we get some good cooperation from some of the private developments here, North uh, Northwest Soccer Club the Edmond Soccer Club, the Southwest, uh, South Oklahoma City Soccer Club, groups like that. But uh, we lose uh, events on a fairly regular basis to other cities that have uh, much more vibrant uh, city-operated parks and recs programs with league play uh, than we have. College World Series is a great example. During the College World Series, there will be two additional major tournaments played here. These are youth tournaments that wind up being played here, but they're played in Edmond, in Shawnee, in Guthrie, places outside of Oklahoma City. And so that's one of, uh, we, we put that in there because that's one of the things that perhaps, you know, in a future round of maps, you know, we could take a look at uh, of having some, uh, some publicly owned facilities that would give us the ability to host more of those types of activities. Um, we're delighted that that they do this in Edmond because we get most of the hotel rooms. But I sure wish it was in Oklahoma City where we would get more of the revenue, not just from the hotels, but from other aspects also. And so it's those types of things that we see that other cities are in fact doing and uh, just kind of plant the seed that maybe in, in out years we can continue to look at some of those things. We get excellent cooperation in the Parks and Recs Department now. It's the limits that they have. and so. You know, at some point, uh, I think it's something we need to take a look at. Thanks. Right. Mike, I, I know that we're looking at a new campaign. We've kind of run this cool and warm or, for a long time, and we're looking at rolling something out. When might we expect to 
see your thoughts on that. Um, we are, we have just received information uh, back uh, within the last few weeks on the research that was done and uh, to nobody's surprise really the, the, the remarks, uh, we've, we've moved the needle some but not as much as we would like to and the remarks continue to be the same uh, from uh, potential visitors. Once they come to Oklahoma City, they leave wowed. You know, and their, their comments are, I can't believe what I saw. Well, we've got to do more and continue to try to do better to show them up front what to expect uh, as opposed to what many of them uh, have the image of. So we're working on that right now. Uh, we think that within the next 30 days that we will have something to release and, uh, and begin uh, using in our, uh, in our advertising. Uh, our ad program, I mentioned the social media a few, a few minutes ago, we're probably going to go much more with electronic uh, dissemination of information. There will still be print pieces available and there will be print advertising done, but as the, as the world moves more to electronic, to internet advertising, to social media, uh, all of those types of things, we'll probably be doing much more in that regard than we're doing now because we now have a better definition of who our target is. That was one of the big things out of this is who's the decision maker, how do we get to them, what are some of the things we need to be doing. It was interesting talking to people. We know that we get a, a pretty significant crowd coming from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but there's a whole lot more down there uh, that, that we can get to come to Oklahoma City. And it was interesting uh, from focus groups conducted in the Dallas-Fort Worth area to hear them talk about I-35 south to the Gulf is a parking lot. And for those weekend getaways, we get on I-35 headed south and after two hours of sitting in traffic, we turn around and go home. And so that's a great audience for us because instead of sitting in that parking lot, you can get on I-35 north and be up here in two and a half hours, maybe three, but you know, we want you here safely. So you know, those are the kinds of things we're looking at. You know, of, of identifying those folks and continuing to look at Kansas City and at Wichita and areas around here that are good solid drive markets, doing a better job of telling them what we have, honing in the message and getting them to come here and spend their dollars. They're already doing it. We just know that there's more of them that we can, can work with. So that's the direction we're heading. Thank you, Meg. Other questions? Questions for Mike? No, but I do have a couple of comments regarding the soccer fields. We've historically funded those out of geo bond issues. We did that's how we did South Lakes Park, and we've got uh, uh, Woodson Park is under construction at this point in time, um, and we do have a, a large complex that's privately operated, but on public lands up at up at Lake Hefner, um, north or north right. of Lake Hefner, and so we do have several facilities. The softball side uh, has been really done, like you said, by private groups. I mean, there, there there's. There, there are several complexes in the metro area that are, that are private groups, so we haven't spent public dollars to, to compete with private groups in that area because generally the need has been has been met along those lines. So different yeah, and, different markets. And, and I would I would compliment the folks at South uh, at the South Oklahoma City for the 2007 uh, U.S. Uh, regionals, U.S. Uh, soccer regionals that we held last year. We worked with Northwest uh, Oklahoma City and the Edmond Club jointly. Um, you know, again, it's, as I, as I said, you know, it's one of those things that we just need to continue to think about because there are a lot of opportunities out there and we just need to, uh, to continue to find ways to mine those opportunities and uh, continue to move Oklahoma City forward. But uh, we appreciate the facilities we have. Uh, you know, it's kind of like other things, we'd like to see more. So, you know, at some point in time, those things we know will come around. So, other questions? Thanks again for your support. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Before we get to the, to the uh, uh, sales and use tax report, uh, Mike gave us a nice segue. I'd like to introduce our new parks director who mm -hmm. began uh, working for us this morning. Doug Cupper is here. Doug comes from Wichita. Uh, and Doug is a career parks and rec guy. He actually, at a young age, decided that's what he wanted to do in life and actually has a degree in parks and rec from Ohio State University. And you know, Doug is, is just, uh, his energy and his excitement about being to Oklahoma City is, is I think something that will be contagious. Uh, Councilman White had an opportunity to meet with him at, a, at an event last week or the week before and was able to spend some time, but I encourage you to all get, get to know uh, Doug and I think he'll be a, a, a great addition to our executive team. And Doug, anything you'd like to share with us this morning? Well, like the uh, previous speaker, 
I made the trip down a couple of times, fell in love with your city and with Wendell leaving. It just, uh, it was a, a dream come true, actually. I, I've loved Oklahoma City for a number of years now. I'm just looking forward to working with all of you to make it even a better place to live. Thanks very much. Welcome. The uh, sales tax use tax reports for May were, were strong. We've talked about this previously, but one thing I do want to point out that if you add the use tax and, 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 and uh, sales tax, general fund collections to date, it's, it's right about $280,000 is what we've collected, and we projected about 280000 or I'm sorry, $280 million. We projected about $280,500,000. So if you take a look at that, it's 0.2%. Off of, off of what we project is what we came in. That's pretty amazing. But it's even more amazing is that our economists projected that it was going to be a little sluggish until we got to the last quarter of our fiscal year, which is April, May, and June. And so far, he's been correct. Those have the, been the strong checks for us to date. And so it's a, just surprising to me, one, how accurate our, 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 our budget office is in, in doing, doing the projections, but also our key economists who we take guidance from for making those projections. How, how well they do do hit, but we have had some strong months uh, uh, the last couple of months, and so that, as we talked about in the past, will give us the opportunity um, to add uh, some some money back to, to the budget for some additional programs. Yeah. Also striking, I thought, when you look at the um, the um, suburban cities and how they did, they had, you know, we had eight percent growth. They had double digit growth in Norman, Edmond, and more. So. Uh, the entire metro area is doing well, but our, our suburban cities are, are in many ways outpacing us. So uh, just a reminder of that uh, sales tax erosion that, that occurs occasionally. But why, why, I can't remember why the economy, why is it the final quarter? Is it coming out of the winter or? No, there were a lot of factors that led into that. I think uh, generally it was, it, it, was, it was led by the energy sector and as, as how they were rebounding and what was projected to happen to the growth in the energy sector. Maybe Doug or Craig could come back in and, and reemphasize exactly what, what those factors were. But, that, but that's a pattern year to year, is that fun? Yeah, it wasn't or? seasonal. No. no, it was it was it was it was it was uh, industry specific events that were happening out there that, that led him to those projections. Okay. All right, I, uh, citizens to be heard, Michael Hinton. Go on, Doug. All right, Craig just walked in the room. Okay. Can you give us a couple of... Yeah, and I think you're right. that Part, part of it, too, was in the first part of the year was the impact of kind of the restructuring that was going on in the energy sector that was slowing us down, and, and then also the effect of the sequestration and the effect on federal jobs and the contractors, and so then it was coming back out of that. But it is tied to wage growth. So mm -hmm. seeing projecting wage growth going forward. Morning, Michael. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor, Your Honor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City. My name is Michael Hinton, 1729 Northwest 3rd Street, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73106. I come to share with all of you that I've been in contact with Mr. Jason uh, Fairbrush, if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. He's the interim director of Embark, and I have some proposals to offer Embark Transit for further enhancement of the city's public transit system. One is that I'm hoping to bring back a steering committee of which I had a lead role when Metro Transit was in operation under Mr. Randall Hume, the past director of Metro Transit. The formation of this committee would be of recruiting a member from each ward of the city to make assessments of the peculiarities of that ward and needs as far as public transportation is concerned. The committee would meet on findings and present them to COTPA and this council recommendations for consideration. Also, I am pleased to report that I've shared with hundreds of folks around this city and the city of Edmond, Oklahoma, regarding a substantial reduction in their insurance rates if they make use of public transportation. This is information that is virtually not publicized. The way this works is that drivers of their motor cars that use parking lot rides such as Walmart, Target, Lowe's, Mardell, or Hobby Lobby lots and board public transit to whatever destination they're going would get a substantial reduction in insurance rates. These reduced rates depends upon the insurance agent drivers are insured with. I've received overwhelming positive feedback from motor car owners. 
Just recently, a lady told me of a 60% cut on her insurance as a result of parking her car and using public transit. Further, I'll be consulting with CityLink of Edmond, Oklahoma, in hopes to get Embark and CityLink to work together in hopes maybe providing weekends service mainly for patrons of major malls, shopping centers, and sports events, namely Thunder Games. Finally, today, folks, I'd like to leave with all of your personal notes about me. I'm continuing to make miraculous uh, comeback <clears throat> from near fatal bodily injury, which included a traumatic head injury over a year ago, which required extensive physical therapy and also speech therapy. With the power of faith and determination, I'm happy to share with all of you that I'm still serving as adjunct professor at UCO in Edmond, a coalition member for Amtrak Heartland Flyer, and ever so happy to be in you folks' midst once again with a restoration of the quality of life and being able to articulate on citizens to be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. All right, we have executive session. We'll be back. Your Honor, may I just comment sure. on Mr. Hinton's suggestions? I think it, it's worth looking into as far as putting together a, a committee of citizens from the various wards to uh, provide input on the uh, Embark system. And I'm also pleased to hear of his recovery and look forward to his continued comments. Thank you.